Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, once again, we're glad to have everybody with us, and uh, for those of you joining us out on television, we're just going to keep on with our Bible study, moving from one verse to the next. And uh, again, I always like to make you aware that we're so thankful for your prayers, your kind letters. My, our mail time is, is, is thrilling. And uh, also, of course, for your financial help, because we do have to pay the bills. That's all part of it. Now, we do not do this to, uh, to encourage sales, but so many have been asking, and we're going to let you know now, that the uh, second half of Revelation, which we taught up at Concordia in St. Paul uh, this last September, are now ready. It's a five-hour video, and uh, it involves the last half of the book of Revelation. We also have the uh, survey of the Bible, which we did in the Tulsa seminar back in June. Now, uh, I've just been taking that long to get it all ready. But it also is a five-hour video. And uh, those both go out posted paid for $25. For those of you who have been calling and asking about it, those uh, are both now ready to send out. Okay, let's go right back to where we were in 1 John chapter 4. And uh, we're going to look at verse 6 once again. Because some of these things we just cannot hurry over. 1 John chapter 4, verse 6. We, John writes, are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. In other words, we can converse with fellow believers. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now you see, the... The unbelieving world cannot discern between error and truth because they don't know what it is. So all they can fall for are the errors. But we're more fortunate than that. Now, to see how Paul addresses it again, for you and I to just latch our teeth into it, if I may put it that way, come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again, where we were in the last program, and then I digressed and I didn't get back to what I wanted to do. But in 1 Corinthians... Chapter 2, I left off at verse 7, the speaking of the wisdom of God in a mystery. But then I'm going to come down to verse 9 and 10. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, I know I'm as guilty as anybody that we use this verse a lot of times to show that those things out in eternity are beyond us. We, we just don't have a handle on it because the Bible just doesn't deal with it. But that isn't what Paul is really talking about. What he's talking about are the things that pertain for us today in our everyday experience. Because, you see, coming out of verse 9... The things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but, see, but God has revealed them unto us, how? By his Spirit. Now go back and read verse 9 again. As it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man, the things which God has, past tense, prepared for them that love Him. In other words, human comprehension can't touch it. There's just no way we can figure out all that God has done. Like I said in the last half hour, we can't comprehend all that Christ accomplished at the cross. It's beyond us. We just take what little we understand by faith. All right, but now look what he says. These things God has prepared for them that love him. Eye has not seen, ear hath not heard. But, flip side, God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. Oh, not all of it, of course. But God has revealed so much of this by the Spirit for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
Now verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save or except the spirit of man which is in him? In other words, how can a human understand human things unless he's a human? That's simple, isn't it? In other words, something in the animal kingdom cannot comprehend the things that are dealing with humanity. They're not of the same makeup. All right? Even so, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. In other words, it's just as logical for a lost man to understand the things of God as for a dog to understand human practice. Now, that's an extreme, I know, but it still makes the point. It is utterly impossible for lost people to comprehend the Word of God. It's beyond them. And like I mentioned in the last program, that's why we're so thrilled with all these letters stating that now that they have come to trust the gospel and they have come to a real saving knowledge of God, they're understanding the Bible. Well, actually, that's the way it's supposed to be. I'll never forget a gentleman, I, I don't want to make it too identifying, but I'll never forget several years ago I had a gentleman come into the class, one of these guys who knew nothing but thought he knew it all, and he was trying to give me some argument afterwards, and I had a fellow who had been saved out of a rather horrible background, but had just become so engrossed in the Word of God, and he was overhearing all this, and he finally come up and he tapped the guy in the shoulder and he said, listen, buddy. He says, if you ever get saved, then you'll know what you're talking about. Well, you know, that's so true. See, the, these people can talk about the Scriptures, they can argue them, but they are totally ignorant of what they're talking about. All right, and so that's what Paul is saying, that unless you have the Spirit of God, there is no way you can understand the things of God. It has to be through the Spirit. All right, now read on. Now we have received, see, we believers, we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, the things pertaining to God, that we might know the things which are freely given us of God. In other words, you don't have to go and pay a high tuition to learn the things of God. The spirit will reveal it freely, providing we take the step of wanting to learn. All right, now verse 13. Which things, Paul says, we also speak, that is, the things pertaining to God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. And how do we get that? comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's why I'm always trying to compare Scripture with Scripture so that we can see the whole concept and how it all fits together. And only the Holy Spirit can unfold that for us. Now then, verse 14. Now he comes back to that unbelieving person again. But the natural man, the unsaved person, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. He can't. He can't. Because the Spirit can only work through the believer. All right? So the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they, the things of God, are what? Foolishness to him. Neither can he know them. Why? They're spiritually discerned. And so this is what we have to understand. Don't get impatient with that lost person who can't understand what you're trying to tell him. It's impossible for him until he becomes a believer. And then all of a sudden it opens up. And then all the questions get answered, see. But here's a lot of times where we are remiss and we get uptight and impatient with people when they can't see these things and they can't understand them. But always remember, that's the reason. They're blind as bats spiritually speaking, because they've never had their eyes opened by the Spirit. All right, since you're in Corinthians, you might as well go a few pages to the right and go to 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. I alluded to it earlier this afternoon. 
but I didn't want to take time then to look it up. But now we will, since you're this close to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and drop in at verse 3. And if the Apostle Paul experienced it, well, then goodness sakes, we don't have to feel badly that they don't understand us. Verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. They can't comprehend it. Why? Verse 4, In whom the God of this world Satan, the one who can transform himself into an angel of light, as we saw earlier. But in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, see, there's where Paul gives him his true deity again, this Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But it can't. They're blind. They've got a blindfold on. And they cannot see these things until God in His saving power removes the blindfold. All right, now let's come back. We'll make a little more headway in 1 John. And now for these Jewish believers, it's much the same thing. By virtue of their faith in who Jesus of Nazareth really was, God has reckoned them as saved, just like he did Peter back in Matthew 16. All right, now then verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Now I'm back in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth, that is, someone else, is born of God and knoweth God. Well, now here again, see, John stops short of what we would call Paul's gospel. He's still on that Jewish economy that as soon as they believed that Jesus was the Christ, they had God's salvation for them, and they, too, would now have that ability to love one another. All right, now verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Well, now that's so much in line with John's gospel, where over and over in John's gospel, he's speaking of this concept of love. Love one another, and so on and so forth. All right, but Paul does as well. Paul speaks of love, and so I'm going to look at that one. 1 Corinthians, no, Romans, I'm sorry, Romans, chapter 13. Romans, chapter 13. And we're speaking of the same agape love. Romans 13, just a minute, honey. Verse 8. Romans 13, verse 8. All got it? Romans 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything, or don't defraud is a better translation, I think. Don't defraud. There's nothing wrong with having a mortgage on your house. So that's why I always have to stop and explain this. I don't want people to think that it's totally wrong to borrow money or owe somebody. No, there's nothing wrong with a legitimate mortgage. Israel did it all through their history. But defrauding, that's something else. So that, that's taking advantage of people or whatever. All right. But instead of defrauding someone, we're to love one another. Now, this is Paul. See? For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Well, now that's sign of different for Paul to say because we know that Christ fulfilled the law with the work of the cross. But that same love that brought about the cross is now imputed to us and our love now goes out to the people around us. Consequently, verse 9, Paul doesn't leave us lawless. We're not under law, but we're not lawless. Or the word I've often used through the years is 
Grace is not license. See? We aren't just free to go and do as we please. But all right, since we have now experienced God's saving grace by his love, then it follows that all the things that pertain to the law of God are appropriate for us. And here it is. Because of this thou shalt not commit adultery. Why? Because as soon as you commit adultery, you're not showing love for the God that has saved you, nor are you showing love for the, for the spouse that you're cheating on. It just won't fly. And so since love is the key, these things cannot be appropriate. Thou shalt not kill. Well, that's obvious. You can't kill somebody that you love. Thou shalt not steal. That's obvious. You can't steal from somebody if you love them. Thou shalt not bear false witness. How can you gossip about somebody that you love? See? It's also commonsensical. Thou shalt not covet. How can you be envious of someone you love? Just the opposite. You're glad that they're being blessed. See? And if there be any other commandment that is purely comprehended in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, because love works no ill to his neighbor. So the whole concept of God is love. Now, while I'm on the subject of the Ten Commandments, I would better remind people of this. Paul makes mention of nine of the Ten Commandments, just like he does here. And then in Ephesians, he speaks of the one pertaining to children and their respect for parents. That's Ephesians 6. You don't have to look it up, honey, but Ephesians 6, verse 1 he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So, Paul repeats nine of the ten commandments. He never touches the other one. What is it? The Sabbath. He never says, Obey the Sabbath and keep it holy. Because that was something that was totally removed from the Christian experience. And uh, that is so obvious throughout all of his epistles that even though love demands are adhering to the other nine not as a means of salvation but only as a result of it but never are we admonished to keep the seventh day sabbath all right let's go back to first john again make a little more headway chapter four verse nine chapter four Verse 9, And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Now, there's nothing new in that, as His eternal life was imparted to us as a result of our faith, then that is eternal life. All right, verse 10, Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. Now you might want to underline that. The whole work of the cross was triggered by God's love for mankind. Now as John is writing, of course, I think he has to come back, that God sent His Son into the world first and foremost to bring Israel to a knowledge of himself so that he could fulfill all the promise. Now that reminds me of a verse that I haven't used lately. I have in the past, but not lately. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. I think this may be appropriate time to use it. Romans 15, verse 8. Romans 15, verse 8. In fact, I've told somebody one time I can have a subject for a seminar that can range almost from anything from anything, and I can start everyone with this verse. I can start any seminar all day or whatever on this verse because it just simply is the benchmark for almost all of Scripture. Here it is, Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say <clears throat> that Jesus Christ was, past tense, a minister of the circumcision. That's Israel. 
Jesus Christ was a minister of the nation of Israel for the truth of God to confirm or bring to fruition or to fulfill the promises made to whom? The fathers. Well, who were the fathers in Scripture? The patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then later on Moses, and later on still David, and then the prophets. All of these promises were made to the nation of Israel with regard to Christ's first coming, or what we call his first advent. And what was the purpose? To give Israel the Messiah and the King and the kingdom that they had been longing for. That was the whole purpose of his coming. Now, of course, when all that was rejected, then the final purposes was to bring him to the cross. But that is not what brought him to the nation of Israel. He came to the nation of Israel to fulfill the promises made to the fathers, to Israel. And so everything in his earthly ministry was programmed in that direction. And then once, of course, the Apostle Paul is sent to the Gentiles, then it becomes that worldwide offer of salvation to the whole human race. All right, well, we've got six minutes left. Maybe we can finish the chapter this afternoon. All right, verse 10. No, maybe I won't get any further in verse 10. <laughs> There's a tremendous word here that I just can't slip over. <laughs> Verse 10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. We've already looked at that. And he sent his son, there's a S-O-N capitalized, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Now, I dare say I could ask the average church member up and down the streets of Tulsa or any other city in America, what's propitiation? And they don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. I had a gentleman call me just the other day asking, he says, what is propitiation? Well, let's look at the other place it's used. Back up a page or two. Chapter 2, verse 2. So it's not just a strange word that is slipped in here by accident. But now in 1 John, chapter 2, verse 2, we have the same word. And he, Jesus Christ, of verse 1, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now that's where John comes a little bit further than James and Peter, in that he's now reaching out to not just Israel, but the whole world can come in and benefit from this work of the cross. All right, so the propitiation for our sin. Now let's come all the way back to Romans, chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, let's start with verse 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Now here it comes from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And this is again part of the revelation of the mysteries. At verse 23, I suppose we should read instead of 24, honey. Start at verse 23. For all, the whole human race, not just Israel, not just Gentiles, everybody. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a blanket condemnation. But that's not where it stops. Verse 24, being justified freely, without cost, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption, that is, the process of paying the price that is in Christ Jesus. Now here it comes. 
whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. But I have to take the next verse as well. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, not ours, his, that he, God, might be just, totally fair, and be the justifier of him or that person who believeth in Jesus. That is the work of the cross. All right, now the propitiation. What are Paul and John talking about? Well, I think the best way that I can explain it in two minutes, got to do this fast. Well, you go all the way back to Exodus and into the tabernacle out there in the wilderness. You remember that you had the brazen altar out at the front and then the labor, which contained the water, and then you came into the sanctuary, the front part of the, of the tabernacle, and in the front room, as you came in, was the seven lamp, the candlestick. Across the room was the table of showbread. And in the middle of the room was the altar of incense. But behind the veil, now in the little room at the back, Behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant, in which were the tables of stone, as well as Aaron's rod, stick, walking stick, that had budded. Now, what did all that show? Well, it showed that the law was buried because the Ark was really a, cover, a, a coffin, remember, and the Almond rod that budded was an indication of new life. That as the law was put to death, out came new life. Now all of that was consummated then under that mercy seat where not only was the wrath, as I've spent earlier this afternoon, not only was the wrath of God expended, but also God's what? Mercy. And you put all that together and that's propitiation. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.